Hello guys and gals, Buffalo here. I get some complaints in my videos from time to time that I don't shoot enough groups. So we're gonna start this video off right off the bat with a five shot group. We're at 100 yards. I checked the, uh, we're right on the money. I checked it with the laser rangefinder. Shooting these, these are my reloads. These are hard cast, bare tooth bullets, 250 grain, wide flat nose. Uh, gas checked bullet. Now, if you guys have tuned in to see some amazing shooting, you might be watching the wrong channel. But if you've tuned in to see some real world stuff, pour you a cup of coffee like I've got here and sit back and we'll shoot and talk about this gun a little bit. Man, it is cold out here today. I don't normally drink a lot of coffee before I shoot groups, but I figure the trade-off of being warm and shaky is better than being cold and shivering. So, let's see what I can do here. I can't see where I'm hitting, but with that secondary camera, I'm sure you guys can tell. Alright, there's five shots, so keep in mind I am using iron sights. Now these aren't the or original sights that came on the gun. Uh, the original sights were a semi-buckhorn style. And uh, I've still got the original front sight, but I took the hood off. I didn't like the hood being in the way. And I added a Skinner Express rear sight. So not going to go into a lot of detail on this rear sight since I've already got a video up on this site, but I will link that video in the description. If this Skinner site is something that uh, you want a closer look at, you can check that video out. I'll go down here and get this target and see what it looks like. All right. So, if you take the farthest two apart and measure from center to center, I shot exactly a three inch group, five shots at 100 yards. So, I'm happy with that. That's about the best I can do with this carbine. You know, I've shot some smaller groups, but not much smaller. And I've shot some larger groups, but really happy with three inch group, five shots. It's cold out here. Let's go in, warm up for a minute, and we'll head down to the pistol range. And I'll get the better camera out, and we'll take some close-ups of this uh, carbine. And talk about some of the pros and cons of it.
So what we're looking at here today is a Marlin 1894 chambered in 44 Magnum, 44 Special. It'll shoot either one. This one was produced in 2015, which is the latest generation of the Marlin 1894. We're not going to cover the other generations. It's not going to be like a history video or anything. We're just going to talk about this, this newest model. And it's also the one that people refer to as Rimlin or a, a Marlington. And when they say that, they don't usually mean it in a very nice way. Um, Remington really went through some problems when they first got this line. I'm sure a lot of you have heard the stories. I know I've heard the stories, you know, over and over, and I'll kind of repeat here what I've been told. In 2007, uh, December of 2007, Remington bought Marlin. And then in 2010, Remington announced that they would be closing the North Haven, Connecticut plant and moving production of these lever guns over to the Ilion, New York, Remington plant. So upon doing so, they got all the machines moved over and, and realized the machines were pretty much worn out. They were really old machines and just had seen their better days. And the drawings, the technical drawings, had handwritten notes all over them where the, the highly skilled craftsmen over at the Marlin plant had worked around the old machines. They knew them inside and out. They know where you know where to add a few thousands or take away a few thousands to keep everything in tolerance. But those highly skilled craftsmen didn't come to New York. So, and a lot of those guys were disgruntled. And you know, really, who can blame them for for feeling cheated there? Uh, that their jobs got moved to New York. So, uh, word has it that some of those guys sabotaged some of the machines. It, they were already bad enough. So Remington would have had a tough enough time as it was, but some of those guys sabotaged the machines and, and got them all out of whack. And the result was for a few years there, Remington put out some really crappy lever guns. And the 1894 was probably the crappiest of the crappy at the time. It seems like it took the brunt of the uh, abuse there. But so for, I don't know, two or three years there, from there's a certain few years where even you know some gunsmiths would charge an extra amount just to work on one of those guns they were they were that bad they were horrible but in 2013 i think i've got that year right remington made the decision to invest back into the lever guns best invest back into the 1894 line with new machines new tooling new drawings and you know, I'm, I'm glad they done that. They could have just pulled the plug on it and said, you know, these things are crap, we can't build them, we're done. And that would have been a, this gun would have went down in history. But they decided to reinvest in it and put a lot of money and time back into it. Got new drawings even to work with. And ever since then, from, I don't know, I'm just throwing years out there, but it's rough timeline, ever since about, 20, late 2014 and on up, these guns have just gotten better and better uh, as far as quality goes to getting them out the door. And today, this is uh, we're this is my first video of 2018 actually, so happy new year to you guys. But here we are in January of 2018 and these are finally getting some of the respect that they deserve again. So I'm gonna show you guys some close-ups of this one and we'll talk about it a little bit. Try to do some more shooting. I've got a bunch of ammo here. All this is my reloads, except for this box of 44 Special. We'll shoot some of those. Um, I don't ordinarily shoot 44 Special in this gun, but I got some requests to shoot some 44 Specials through it. I've shot a box or two through it, and it runs them okay. It doesn't feel quite as smooth as it does with the with the 44 Magnum cases. And I reload, so like these here, are 44 ma or specials, but they're in Magnum cases. So I never shoot 44 special cases. I just I just don't fool with it. I just load my my specials in Magnum cases because I don't I don't own a gun that's only chambered in 44 special. But we will shoot some of those today. And I've got a lot of uh, like those cast bullets I shot in the opening of this video. Got some jacketed stuff. We'll talk about that here in a little bit. Let's talk about this gun. So the 1894 in 44 does have a 10 round tubular magazine. 
and you feel that via the loading gate on the right hand side of the receiver and what I like about the uh, let's go right in there what I like about the loading gate is you can shoot a few rounds and then when there's a break in the action you can go ahead and top back off through the loading gate without having to pull out your magazine tube and drop them in like that like on some of the other models now this one is also side ejecting and what I mean by that is it kicks your spent casings out the side instead of out the top like on some of the other ones and that allows them to give you a drilled and tapped top on the receiver so it makes it real easy to add an optic or to do like I did and add a Skinner aftermarket sight it just makes it really easy to work with there now it does have a crossboat safety kind of looks out of place on the gun even though Marlin's been putting those on their lever guns since the early 80s. They just still, to me, kind of look weird, but not a deal breaker. Not nothing that I couldn't learn to live with, at least for me. Has a safety under here that engages when the lever is closed all the way up. What that does, it won't allow the gun to fire out of battery. The, the lever has to be all the way closed in order for that hammer to fall. If it's just slightly open, you can't pull that trigger. So it, it's a safe gun to carry and hunt with. Um, a lot of people do hunt with this gun. I haven't got to hunt with it yet, but makes a great woods deer gun or brush gun, they call them. Now, it, it comes with sling studs on the gun already. I added the Montana sling, you know, that's a it's a decent sling in my opinion. It does everything I need it to do. It looks good. And it doesn't have a bunch of hardware on the sling. It's, it's a hardware free sling the way it's tied up here. So the hardware doesn't scratch your finish up. Now, this uh, bullseye here is just a Marlin trademark. You'll notice that on their rifles. And, and that lets you identify that it's a Marlin when it's sitting on the gun rack behind the counter. You see that trademark bullseye there. That is not a place to drill and put a swivel stud don't do it i've seen them done that way personally in the in a pawn shop here locally they've got one in right now that has the bullseye drilled out and a swivel stud put in it that's that's not what that's for but the swivel stud will actually go about an inch and a half or so below that that bullseye now i love this gun and I would definitely buy it all over again. If I didn't have this one, I'd go buy me one. That's how much I like it. But there are a few negatives that I want to talk about, or at least negatives in my opinion. And this is where I get myself in trouble a lot of times. It seems any time that I mention a negative or a con about a gun, you know, and it, this doesn't come from my regular subscribers. I have, uh, I have very sensible subscribers, but viewers that, find a video down the road maybe through the search function or whatever man they really get ticked off if i say something negative about a gun that more than likely they've just bought i don't know but i figure they've probably bought it kind of kind of invested in it and to hear somebody say something bad about it it just it really ticks them off i get a lot of hate mail when i do that but you know it's part of doing a gun review so there's a few things that i would change about this gun we'll talk about those right now one of them is the very slow twist rate. It's got a one in 38 inch twist rate, meaning the spin that it puts on the bullet, uh, it'll turn that bullet one, one full turn in 38 inches. So very slow, doesn't stabilize the heavy bullets really well, like the uh, 300 grain plus uh, 44 Magnum bullets. I've had, I've had spotty luck with those poor accuracy most of the time and in some cases uh, even tumbling so it seems like the sweet spot for this gun is between 240 and 260 grain bullets and or at least with this particular one and nothing wrong with that i like that range of bullets you know a 250 grain hard cast punched all the way through a deer is, is going to do just as much damage as a 320 grain hard cast punched all the way through a deer in my opinion so uh, the, the hole's not going to be any bigger around so 
it, it works out okay, but I do wish that I had a little faster twist rate so I could play with some a, a wider variety of bullets and take advantage of a lot of the bullets that are offered for hand loaders and reloaders like myself. Uh, another thing, the groove diameter in these barrels is is oversized. It's it's not technically oversized. It's to the it's to the industry standards. There's a there's an industry standard out there that that says for rifles the groove diameter should be 431 thousandths of an inch for a 44. Now that same same people that set that standard on the pistols they call for 429 thousandths of an inch. So and that doesn't really affect jacketed bullets from what I've seen. Uh, long as they're within the proper weight range, jacketed bullets seem to shoot fine. But when you shoot cast bullets, like, like I shoot a lot of, you need to keep that in mind and get oversized cast bullets. I shoot uh, 432 thousandths of an inch diameter cast bullets. I don't think I've got, I don't have any just the bullets down here, but, but I, I get the oversized bullets and it, it works out real well. There's no leading in the barrel. It, uh, they stabilize real well. Again, so long as you're within what that 1 in 38 twist rate will handle. Now, a lot of people say that the, you know, that dates back to the micro groove barrels. The, they were oversized on the groove diameters, but it also carried, you know, they've been putting the Ballard cut rifling in since the mid nineties. And it also carries over to those, uh, in fact, I slugged this barrel. I pushed a, a slug of soft, pure lead through the barrel with a wooden dowel and then measured my groove diameter, the imprint on this lead slug and got 0.4315. So you really, in general, you'll want to go 1,007 inch over your groove diameter on your cast bullets. I'm not quite going that far with the 432s, but they work out real well. No leading, nothing like that. Now, if you shoot, that, that's one of the downsides is if you've got a pet load for your revolver and you're buying this rifle to shoot those same loads that you shoot in your revolver, you might not be able to do that. You might not have, if you're shooting a 430 diameter bullet, cast bullet in that revolver, this gun may not like it. It may, uh, it may lead the barrel, it may tumble, It'll, it may give poor accuracy, so really with cast anyway, you'll need a pet load for your rifle, and more than likely, it won't be the same as the pet load that your that your revolver likes. So, to me, that's a that's a downside. That's a negative. Now, one more, well, a couple more things here that are just trivial. The the four in stock here just feels, you know, it's a really good handling. Uh, carbine but it just feels a little bit thick you know i think they could narrow that down and really 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 you know dot the i's and cross the t's on the handling of this rifle the other thing and this one don't bother me but you know i've heard a lot of people talk about it and they don't like it is the the trigger they call it trigger flop that trigger just kind of hangs there like a loose tooth when the gun's cocked and ready to go. Now, I don't notice, but just the nature of working a lever action, when I'm coming up to my trigger, I've already got it back, so I don't really notice it. But if you, if you look, it will, it does have a lot of play in it. And there's an aftermarket trigger, I think it's called a Wild West Trigger Happy Kit or something along those lines that, uh, that you can put in. And not only will it get rid of that trigger flop, It'll lighten up your trigger pull. So, you know, it may, I'm not complaining about the trigger, but maybe I'll try one of those later on just to share my results with you guys and, and see what kind of difference it actually does make. So that's about it for my complaints on this gun. Shoot a few of these 44 special through it. That's uh, 
I've shot a couple boxes. This would be the third box. These are semi wad cutter cast bullets. I just want to show the function with the 44 specials. I have had a few, uh, not, not jam ups, but a few times with the 44 specials where I kind of have to jiggle the lever to get them to cycle. So cycle fine that time, and in most times they do. It's not a regular problem. It just does overall seem to like the magnums a little better. So we shot that. Now these are also 44 specials, but they're loaded in magnum cases. These are round nose. Never want to shoot pointy bullets in a tubular magazine. These are round nose. That's about as pointy as I want to get with it. I load these 44 specials up because they're easy on my steel targets. Some of these really hot 44 Magnum loads, I don't like to shoot my steel with, especially the hard casts like those bare tooth bullets. Uh, they'll leave craters on my steel. So 44 specials in Magnum cases. All right, so work just fine with those too. The action is really pretty smooth. When I first got the gun, it was just a, I wouldn't call it rough, but it was a little stiff. Of course, over time that worked out pretty smooth now. Got some really hot 240 grain Hornady XTPs here. The creeks froze over. Let's see if we can punch through the ice. Oh yeah. There you go. There's the Buffalo's Outdoors logo. <laughs> That's really all I got today, guys. The links to my other social media accounts are in the video description, as always. And I am on Patreon now, if anybody wants to swing by there and help me out, it's much appreciated. But that's all I've got, and I'll talk with y'all again soon.